Well, welcome to uh, the Washington History Seminar. Uh, welcome to the Wilson Center. The <coughs> Washington History Seminar, as uh, I think most of you um, know, is a uh, co-sponsored by the National History Center and the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. And we're delighted um, to feature Professor Laura Beers today on her book, Red Ellen, The Life of Ellen Wilkinson, Socialist, Feminist, Internationalist. Uh, let me just say, um, it's particular uh, that, that my, first I should announce that my regular co-chair, um, Eric Arneson from GW, is uh, uh, out of the country. So um, uh, we have the privilege of having Dane Kennedy, the president of the National History Center, um, co-chair today's event. Um, let me also acknowledge um, Professor Roger William Roger Lewis, um, who is here with us today, the, form, the founding uh, director of the National History Center and founding co-chairman of the seminar, mm -hmm. um, all the way up from uh, from Austin. And just with maybe Roger, you should hold it up. Just with a, uh, a copy of his uh, latest book that will hopefully launch sometime this spring. Um, indispensable reading, reading uh, 1,001 books. Um, we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have an event announcement about this uh, later this sp spring, but congratulations on this, Roger. Um, let me uh, thank um, uh, all of you for joining us and all of, uh, and all of you who are, uh, continue to, to um, support the seminar. Um, if you uh, are not yet a supporter, Please, uh, tomorrow is, I think, Giving Tuesday, and both the National History Center and the Wilson Center would greatly appreciate um, your support for the seminar. Um, Pete Bierstecker, all the way in the back, and um, um, Amanda Perry. Amanda Perry, I'm sorry, <laughs> all the way in the back as well, on the right side. Uh, from the National History Center, um, as always, have done the heavy lifting in terms of getting us organized here. Um, let me ask you to turn off your uh, mobile devices, and I think with that, turn it over to Dane for the introduction of our featured speaker today. Yeah, well, it, it gives me a, a particular pleasure to be here to, to introduce uh, Laura Beers, who I've now known for quite a while, a, a fellow British historian in the D.C. area, although she has a kind of transatlantic uh, a career that, 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 that also involves uh, a lot of teaching in Britain. Uh, but she's an associate professor at American University and a uh, leading uh, authority on uh, the British Labour Party. Uh, her first book was uh, Your Britain, uh, Media and the Making of the Labour Party, which was published in 2010. Then she co-edited the book uh, Brave New World, uh, Imperial and Democratic Nation Building in Britain in 2012. And most recently, the book that she'll be uh, speaking from or about in one way or another, which uh, Christian already mentioned, uh, Red Ellen, The Life of Ellen Wil Wilkinson, uh, which is a prize-winning book, won the Stansky Prize uh, from the North American Conference of British Studies, and really is an incredibly illuminating and engaging uh, study of a very important figure in British radical and labor politics in the interwar years up to her death in 1947. Uh, I, I should say that I was familiar with her only in the context of the famous Gerald March that took place uh, in, in 1937, I believe. 36. 36. Uh, but uh, it, so it was a revelation for me to realize just the extraordinary range of activities that she was engaged in and the influence that she had. So it's a real pleasure to have you here, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dane, um, and um, bear with me, I'm a bit jet-lagged as I'm newly returned from the UK um, and started my day at 4.15. <laughs> but I'm going to talk to you that um, Wilkinson, well, she's known to most people in Britain predominantly for her role in the Jarrow Crusade in 1936, which I will be discussing today. Um, her reputation has been somewhat sort of 
enhanced in the last several months by all the commemorations of the centenary of women's enfranchisement in 1918. And there'll be a new set of commemorations of the entrance of women into Parliament, um, with the first woman to take her seat in Parliament in February 1919, Nancy Astor. And so in that context, Wilkinson, who served as Britain's second female cabinet minister and was one of the early um, women politicians in the UK, is a kind of, you know, has been having a star role in terms of those commemorations. But I want to talk about Wilkinson today, not predominantly, though I will discuss the way her feminism um, inflected her political agenda, but in terms of the way that her ideas of socialism and social justice um, were played out, not just on a domestic um, stage in terms of events like the Jarrow Crusade, but in terms of her international politics. So I want to start by talking about this spread. Um, in the pages of the picture post that ran in 1940 when Ellen Wilkinson was appointed as parliamentary secretary to the Ministry of Pensions. And the picture post ran a three-page profile on her by her longtime friend, the New Statesman editor, Kingsley Martin. The caption to one of the photos, the one in the lower right-hand corner, which is perhaps my favorite photo of her on a um, zebra <laughs> um, print bedspread in her flat, um, read, she's always been open to new ideas, persistent in promoting those in which she believes. Her new job gives scope to her passionate desire for social justice. The day after her sudden death from heart failure on February 6, 1947, the Manchester Guardian's leader column noted that the woman who ended her career as Minister of Education had, quote, brought to public affairs an acute mind and a brilliant spirit, and the dominant thing in her, a passion for social justice, an intuitive and devoted partisanship for the poor and the weak. Wilkinson herself similarly embraced the term, titling her 1940 Fabian Society lecture, later published in the edited um, volume Program for Victory, Social Justice. So my recent biography of Wilkinson, Red Ellen, the Life of Ellen Wilkinson, Socialist, Feminist, Internationalist, um, <coughs> is on one level an exploration of how Wilkinson understood social justice in both domestic and global terms. It illuminates how one ambitious British radical politician raised in unworldly provincial circumstances could develop a global network of activist colleagues and a global conception of the struggle for social change. It's a story that weaves together overlapping threads of liberal, socialist, feminist, and communist activism to reveal a complex radical network in which Red Ellen was a central actor. The turn of the 20th century ushered in a new era in British and international history when developments in communication and transport combined with and fostered a plethora of international organizations, participation in which allowed men and women from comparatively modest backgrounds to travel widely and gain an experience of different cultural and political systems. Such innovations fostered a radical cosmopolitanism amongst a generation of British men and women, principally men, whose political hands, landscapes would otherwise have been most likely confined within Britain's borders. The International Labour Party, which Wilkinson joined in 1908, was a breeding ground for many radical British politicians in the early 20th century, including many of those prominently involved in the fight against fascism. No two activists follow an identical path to political consciousness, and the pursuit of social justice means different things to different people. Still, by focusing on one woman's political work, I hope in this talk to shed broader light on this culture of interwar radicalism in Britain and internationally. So rather than looking at Wilkinson's career in its entirety, I want to focus on her political itinerary in and around the year 1936 to illuminate the many simultaneous fronts on which she was raising, ra waging political battle in the 1930s. And while this talk focuses on 1936, I'll warn you now that it ends with a slightly meandering digression into her commitment to Indian um, self-rule across the early 20th century. But we're going to start off really focused around the year 1936 when, um, as Dane mentioned, she led the Jarrow Crusade. So nearly 70 years after her death, Wilkinson is principally remembered for her campaigns on behalf of her constituents in Jarrow, embodied in her leadership of the Jarrow Crusade of unemployed workmen from the Tyneside to the Palace of Westminster in October 1936. And this is an image um, from her on the march of the Jarrow Crusaders, about 200 um, men led 
not by Wilkinson, but by members of the town council, march from Jarrow, which is in Newcastle, on the Tyneside, 300 miles to Westminster, to present a petition asking the government um, to intervene to bring employment back to the city, where male unemployment stood at about three quarters of the population for most of the 1930s following the Depression. And Wilkinson, though she didn't march the entire way, um, you know, did participate partly because she knew that her participation as a, you know, she was about four foot ten um, in stocking feet and female, you know, would sort of give this media um, attention to the event that it otherwise wouldn't have attracted. So there's a kind of publicity stunt aspect to these photos um, where she's doing things like learning to play the drums and smoking a fag with a bunch of um, unemployed shipwrights. But it's for this that she um, is, is best remembered, despite the fact that the crusade itself did not achieve its objective of bringing additional employment or government intervention um, to the, the constituency in Newcastle. Yet too narrow a focus on her advocacy on behalf of Britain's unemployed has obscured the extent to which her conception of social justice was drawn on a broader canvas and the ways in which her experiences combating other forms of injustice, from colonialism to fascism to sexism, informed her political work on behalf of the unemployed and vice versa. So now to um, move back a little bit in time, after the general election on the 14th of November 1935, when Wilkinson returned to Parliament after four years in the wilderness, she lost her seat in the 1931 landslide against labor. Wilkinson hired a new secretary, Diana Hopkinson. Hopkinson was the daughter of Ava Hubbock, who, like Ellen, had been a suffrage activist before the war. In a testament to the overlapping personal and political connections that bound together so many politically active women in the period, Ava Hubbock co-owned a cottage in Cornwall with Mary Morehouse, who had been Wilkinson's friend from the Manchester Gills League in the 1910s, with whom Wilkinson had attended the founding conference of the Communist Party in 1920. So Hopkinson had this personal connection to get her first job working for an MP. Diana began immediately after the election and soon felt herself overwhelmed by the task, later recalling that El Ellen's energy was tremendous, but it was most variously dispersed. She was not easy to work for because she had so many strings in her bow. I found it difficult to sort them out. In addition to her parliamentary work, there was her representation of NUDA, that's her trade union, her involvement with the India League, with the left-wing theater project, and with journalism. She was then writing notes for Time and Tide, the sapphic graphic. This was a feminist <laughs> magazine. Sometimes she used to dictate while she was in the bath, shouting to me when I was in the sitting room. So if Ellen's Union, the India League, and the Forum Cinema in Soho posed an immediate challenge, Diana soon also found herself wrapping her head around the Spanish Civil War, the British Iron and Steel Federation's machinations in halting the reopening of the steelworks in Jarrow, and the issue of equal pay for civil servants. Wilkinson, Wilkinson's belief that the fight for social reform did not stop at Britain's borders is evident in a quick review of her diary for 1936. During the course of the year, she made at least seven trips outside of the United Kingdom. In February, she flew to Germany to meet with trade union colleagues and other members of the anti-fascist underground. She also briefly visited Spain. She returned to Spain in March, spending a few days in Paris on her route home where she met with Leon Bloom and spoke to participants in the sit-in strikes in the city's large department stores and Monoprix. In May, she was back in Spain, keeping in close touch with supporters of the popular front government that increasingly appeared under threat from anti-democratic elements within the military and clergy. In August, she set off for Russia with other members of her trade union, only to return to Britain shortly into the voyage as news of the Spanish rebels' advance convinced her that her presence was needed at home. The following week, she was in Paris meeting with the Spanish ambassador and leaders of the international labor movement before flying to Portugal two weeks later to meet with the Spanish Republicans. Preparations for the Jarrow Crusade kept her in Britain for much of the autumn, but at the end of the year, she set sail for the United States, where she undertook a six-week tour that included a visit to the sit and strikes in Flint, Michigan. And here's another great um, Wilkinson photo. Here she is, having climbed in the windows of one of the factories where the sit and strikers were occupying the auto works um, in Flint and speaking to, to striking workers. Wilkinson was criticized in certain sections of the press for her alleged excessive foreign travel and neglect of home affairs. She was, however, adamant that her international travel was inseparable from her career as a British politician. As she argued in her trade union journal, I hold pretty strongly the view that the most useless type of MP is the one that takes no interest in all in what is going on outside of his own country. 
We are too closely knit these days for that kind of parochial outlook. That said, Wilkinson's international travel did not mean that she neglected her parliamentary responsibilities. During the 1936 parliamentary session, she and the prime minister were tied for fourth most valuable MP, as measured by column inches in the parliamentary record. Behind only the Chancellor Neville Chamberlain, the, foreign, the former foreign minister Sir John Simon, and unsurprisingly, Winston Churchill. Throughout 1936, she rarely missed a sitting. Unsurprisingly, given the parliamentary agenda that year, the majority of her contributions to debate concerned domestic affairs, specifically the iniquities of the government's impl implementation of unemployment assistance, and the ongoing issue of what, if any, efforts the government would make to create, to create jobs on the Tyne. Brian Harrison has noted that Wilkinson gave comparatively more of her time to feminist issues than other female MPs. In eight of the debates in which she participated that year, she spoke specifically to issues affecting women as workers, including her April 1st proposal of a successful resolution to equalize pay grades between men and women in the upper echelons of the civil service. Civil servants were in a less precarious position within the capitalist system than the unaffiliated midwives or factory shift workers or female clerks working in moldy sub-basements, whose causes she also championed in Parliament in 1936. Yet, as she pointed out, single, lower middle class women were often handicapped by the obligation to care for dependents, which she termed the cavemen mentality within the treasury and the country more broadly, held to the conceit that most men have wives and families to keep, whereas the single woman wage earner has no one but herself to keep. In truth, it's the fact that today a very large number of salaried women have de other dependents on their salaries, she argued. The argument in favor of equal pay for equal work was self-evident from a women's rights perspective. But Wilkinson argued that it was also imperative to ensure the welfare of postal workers, spinster aunts, essentially. Several MPs had volunteered to put the case for the civil service union. And another member won the lottery to put forth a resolution on equal pay. The case in favor of reform might have cleaved more tightly to a feminist equal rights agenda. But for Ellen, the case for women's equality was inextricably tied up with economics and her arguments in favor of women's rights always incorporated an analysis of the economic injustice that accompanied gender inequality. Ministerial questions give MPs an opportunity to raise issues that might not otherwise come up in debate. While the majority of her questions related to plans for industrial developments in the Northeast, where her constituency was based, approximately 30% addressed foreign policy. These principally related to India and Abyssinia, Although towards the end of the year, Ellen and a small group of MPs began to raise questions about the application of non-intervention policy in Spain, the issue which would dominate her parliamentary attention in 1937. In her treatment of both domestic and colonial affairs, Ellen continually returned to the theme of government accountability. While ministers and the government's backbench supporters turned to variously the vagaries of the market or the independence of colonial administrators to deflect responsibility for perceived injustices, she repeatedly argued that it was up to the government to take responsibility and action. The Jarrow Crusade should be understood both as an effort to force the government to take responsibility for its role in destroying the shipping industry in Jarrow, and to compel practical action to bring jobs back to the constituency. An appreciation of the latter goal is necessary to understand the tactics of the march and Wilkinson's role in it. Unlike some of the more conservative parliamentarians within the Labour Party, Ellen did not object to the principle of direct action, or using strike action to change um, policy. Beyond the British Isles, she supported the Indian National Congress's civil di disobedience campaigns in the 1930s and, um, 1920s and 30s. Nor did she object to collaboration with communists on shared objectives. She herself had left the Communist Party in 1924, and the CP regularly attacked Wilkinson in the columns of the communist papers The Daily Worker and The Week. Yet she maintained close relationships with individual communists through organizations such as the Labor Research Department, the National Unemployed Workers Movement, and later the Committee for the Relief of the Victims of German Fascism and the World Committee Against War and Fascism. In 1936, she sought advice from Wal Haddington, the leader of the Communist National Unemployed Workers Movement, on the logistics of managing a hunger march in preparation for the Jarrow Crusade. Yet although he later claimed that Wilkinson had tried to convince her colleagues in Jarrow to join forces with the NUWM, her conduct during the Jarrow March was intended to distance the event from the communist movement. 
This reflected in part Wilkinson's appreciation of the lessons of the failed 1926 general strike in Britain, which had been launched with the aim of defending wages in the mining industry, but ended with the Trade Union Congress's unconditional surrender. Then, opponents of the strike had focused on the alleged unconstitutionality of extra-parliamentary mass action intended to influence government policy. In 1936, the government again trotted out the rhetoric of constitutionality in an effort to delegitimize the Jarrow Crusaders. Two weeks into the march, the cabinet issued a statement that in this country, governed by a parliamentary system, where every adult has a vote and every area has its representative in the House of Commons to put forward grievances and suggest remedies, processions to London cannot claim to have any constitutional influence on policy. Wilkinson rejected this analysis but she appreciated the sway that it held over members of her own party, as well as over national government MPs. Her own speeches along the march's path and in her journalism, she made a point to emphasize the constitutionality of the marcher's actions. In Time and Tide, the sapphic graphic. She reminded her readers that the march had the backing of all parties on the council, which meant an, which meant an office in the town hall, the official stamp, and all that that applies in constitutional England. She tied efforts to delegitimize the march to the termination of fascist powers to quash free speech, noting that to stigmatize as revolutionary the quiet exercise of our constitutional right, and here's this constitutional rhetoric again, to offer a petition to parliament is dangerous in these days. When constitutional rights are threatened on every side, Democrats should watch vigilantly rights that have been struggled for and won through centuries of British history. Here, Wilkinson tied her anti-fascist activism to her critique of domestic politics. She was by no means blind to the racial aspects of the Nazi state. As early as 1933, she was calling public attention to Nazi persecution of the Jews on British and international platforms. Nonetheless, her analysis of Nazism remained fundamentally socioeconomic. She wrote in her essay on social justice in 1940 that there are many ways of looking at Nazi philosophy such as it is. There is one very practical way of looking at it and that is that of the big businessmen who were behind Hitler when he rose to power and who still have controlling interest in Nazi economic life. Nazism is the big business reply to the unanswerable arguments of socialism that the era of mass production must mean planned organization in an international mar market. Six years earlier, she published the book Why Fascism, co-authored by the German emigre Edward Kahn's, the authors had concluded that fascism was unlikely to come to Britain in the near future, but not because British national character would not embrace such a violent and undemocratic doctrine. Rather, fascism, they argued, should be seen as the political expression of the policy towards the masses of capitalism in adversity. And although British capitalism had taken its hit since the First World War, the system remained stronger in Britain than on the continent. Nonetheless, the authors identified fascist tendencies within the existing British system including what they termed the diminution of the role of parliament, evident in the Unemployment Act, which puts the grievances of the unemployed in the hands of an appointed commission and removes their right to have their grievances voiced in parliament, hence the, um, submitting the petition in the 1936 Jericho Crusade is meant to sort of call this to public attention, and tendencies towards a particular variant of planning with the consent of the capitalist at the expense of the consumer. And here, this is again, you can see echoes of this in the rhetoric that she uses about the decision of the capitalist in collusion or support of the national government to shut down the steelworks in Jarrow as uneconomical, um, despite the loss of jobs that it engendered. Wilkinson also detected fascist currents in the British government's efforts to lower unemployment figures by pushing women out of the industrial workforce. And here again, you see her feminism looping back in with her critique of fascist policy. In a lecture to the Fabian Society in November 1934, she contrasted the status of women in Russia, where economic necessity dictated their equality in the workforce, and in Germany, where the imperative of preparing for war dictated that they remain at home as producers of sons. She argued that if feminism is the luxury of a comfortable state, as in Britain, and not the definite necessity, as in Russia, of a changing economic order, that luxury can be dispensed with and will be as soon as an economic crisis drives again to war and military necessity. She went on to intimate that the government's efforts to push women out of the workforce in Britain might be a sign that the country was drawing herself in again and unconsciously preparing for war. Her logic was premised on the conviction that the realities of the capitalist state are periodic crises and periodic wars, 
And where you get that situation, then the position of women must inevitably be precarious. Only where you get your socialist state do you get equality that is based on something that matters. Notably, Wilkinson later nuanced her arguments about the comparative place of work and feminism in the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and democratic Britain. In the early 30s, she still looked to the Soviet Union as a socialist beacon. After the show trials in the summer of 1936, however, her enthusiasm for Soviet socialism began to wane. Reviewing Hillary Newitt's Women Must Choose in the Daily Herald in June 1937, Wilkinson still lauded the Soviet attitude towards women as workers and citizens over the repressive policies of the Nazi state. However, she concluded by saying that dictatorship, even a dictatorship of the proletariat, was bad for women. Adopting what for her was the rarely used voice of the old guard feminist, she condemned Newitt's disdain for democracy and enthusiasm for Soviet totalitarianism. She intoned that the women who won the vote thought at least they had done one bit of good work. They'd firmly debunked the legend of the big male bow wow. <laughs> and went on to say, <laughs> responsible work, I agree, that is the test. In the democratic countries, as cabinet ministers, members of parliament, doctors, pioneers in welfare and education, writers and trade unionists, their work is responsible and also they can speak their mind. These women haven't to look over their shoulders all the time to see if someone is listening, if someone will tell. I want to rally women to fight as hotly as they ever did for the democratic rights we are in danger of losing. To maintain these rights, I'm willing to sacrifice a lot of the benefits Ms. Newitt sees in the dictatorships, even the Soviet Union. So you see this kind of emphasis on, on democratic um, practices still um, shining through in her politics. Her shifting attitude towards Russia did not debar her continued cooperation with communists at home and abroad, however. She worked closely with her old friends Helen Crawford and Harry Pollitt and other communists in the campaign for the relief of the victims of German fascism, an international organization whose British branch she co-founded in March 1933. Let's see, should be. Talk about this in a moment. When the Labor Party had sought to prescribe the Relief Committee as a communist front, and this is um, a leaflet or a pamphlet actually produced by the Communist Party in which they identify all of these different organizations that they perceive to be communist front organizations. And, you can't see it very well, but down at the bottom, the Committee for the Relief of the Victims of German Fascism is, is identified as part of this co communist solar system, system. So when they sought to prescribe the organization, Wilkinson retorted, I wonder which member of the Labor Party executive or the General Council of the Trade Union Congress, if they have to deal with a man bleeding from fascist whips, would have to ask him before they helped him whether he belonged to the second or the third international. If her contacts within the Communist Party in the common turn, pushed her to see fascism through an economic lens. Her long association with the Geneva-based Women's International League for Peace and Freedom brought her into contact with a group of continental European women who also tended to view fascism in economic terms. The Wolf had been formed as an outgrowth of the Women's Committee for Permanent Peace, which met at The Hague in March 1915. The Wolf women were unique among transnational women's organizations in defining fascism not only in terms of an opposition to war, but also in terms of opposition to economic and social injustice. Wilkinson and several Wolf women from across Europe were instrumental in founding the Women's Committee Against War and Fascism in 1934, which would become a vocal champion of the Republican cause in Spain and an advocate of an anti-fascist popular front. And in case you haven't been able to pick her out, there she is, front row, second from the left, in the white dress. That's in 1919, when she's still in her um, late 20s. Yet although she was involved with several peace organizations in the interwar period, Wilkinson was never a 100% pacifist. As early as April 1915, she questioned how far the Independent Labor Party should go in its commitment to pacifism, asking whether the organization would condemn minors who had recently used force to defend themselves against the National Guard in Ludlow, Colorado. She justified the violence of the Russian Revolution as a necessary evil, and in speeches on Wolf platforms tended to speak in terms of the evils of a capitalist war, as opposed to war per se. In June 1936, she did join the pacifist organization, the Peace Pledge Union, um, whose supporters pledged to renounce war and never again to support or sanction another. But she then quickly left the Peace Pledge Union after the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, when she determined that some wars were indisputably necessary. A few months after leaving the Union, she met the novelist Gustav Regler in Spain, um, who'd gone from imprisonment in Germany for pacifism to taking up arms for the Republicans. 
In Madrid, to keep sane, one must laugh, she wrote in an article in Time and Tide. I chafed him a little for our mu mutual pacifist faith, and he in uniform. He smiled a little too. Then as he kissed my hand in farewell, he said quietly, a pacifist in the face of fascism, I think, is a traitor to liberty. And this was Ellen's, Ellen's own view. Ellen's passionate advocacy for the Spanish Republicans needs to be understood not only in the context of her intellectual critique of fascism, but also in terms of her visceral objection to human suffering, both in Britain and abroad, her idealism, and her respect for the Spanish men and women who were actually taking up arms against fascism. Throughout her career, she was known to be very emotional <clears throat> and was regularly reduced to tears in Parliament and on um, party platforms. When the 1936 Labour Party conference refused to allow an official collection to be taken up for the Jarrow Crusaders, um, Ellen's emotional speech led the hard right Western Daily Mail to observe that a woman's tears are usually more effective than her arguments, a truth which, was Ellen, which, which Ms. Ellen Wilkinson, MP, exemplified as she was overcome by emotion in speaking at the Labour Party conference yesterday on the plight of the distressed areas. When she presented the Jarrow Marcher's petition to the bar of the House four weeks later, the Daily Mail's headline ran, Miss Ellen Wilkinson in tears in columns, in commons. And the article began, Miss Ellen Wilkinson, highly strung socialist MP for Jarrow, laid her copper-colored hair on the rail, rails of the bank of the speechers, speaker's high chair in the House of Commons tonight and wept. It seemed the smallest and slightest of MPs was praying. When she looked up, though, praying or not, there were tears in her eyes. And while the press debated to what degree this emotionalism was, um, was theater and meant for publicity, it's an undeniable aspect of her political presentation um, and her personality more general, generally, and also very visible in her support for the Spanish Republicans. Her respect and empathy for the Republican forces who'd had to create an army almost with their bare hands, she claimed, is palpable in her writing and her speeches at the conflict. Although she could barely speak Spanish, she insisted on visiting the Spanish trenches in Madrid, deliberately because I wanted to meet these men who she characterized romantically as mostly tough Spanish workers and peasants from the nearby countryside, and she spoke about them in very romanticized terms. For Wilkinson, the Spanish Civil War was a clear-cut case of right versus wrong. The Republican loyalists were the elected government of Spain, the popular front had the support of the working classes, whereas the generals had the backing of big business, the Catholic Church, which she insisted was a big business in Spain, and the international fascist. For Ellen, these were the salient points. She proved remarkably willing to overlook the violent acts, attacks on the church by Republican supporters in the early days of the conflict. And arguably more problematically, she turned a blind eye to the increasingly dictatorial behavior of the Soviet Union in Spain. In her view, the Soviet Union was arming and otherwise abetting the Republicans, while her own government did nothing. And she simply did not want to hear that the Russians' motives and methods might be suspect. While her principal work for the Spanish cause was political, Wilkinson also turned her efforts to charity. Her approach to charitable work throughout her career gives a particular insight into her attitudes towards social justice. Many of her colleagues in the international women's movement had come up through the charitable sector, including, among others, Edith Pye, Agatha Harrison, and Barbara Duncan Harris. And some of those women are in this image behind us. Yet Ellen's own views were closer to those of her Labor Party colleague, Clement Attlee, who once famously clip, quipped, charity is a cold, gray, loveless thing. If a rich man wants to help the poor, he should pay his taxes gladly, not dole out money on a whim. When a private philanthropist responded to the Jarrow Crusade by proposing to open a metal tube works on the site of the old shipyard, Ellen bristled, we've got the government cornered, and on no account must this latest offer enable it to avoid its responsibilities. And in the event, the government administrators actually did point to this, this small initiative to open a steelworks as evidence that there was no need for state intervention in Jarrow. So she had called that one. Well, Ellen's element that the state, not private charity, should redress social injustice. She never took the doctrinaire position that charity only propped up the capitalist system. In 1926, following the defeat of the general strike, she agreed to act as chairman of the Women's Committee for the Relief of Minors, Wives, and Children. And in her appeal for funds, she insisted that there's no room these days for armchair hair-splitting socialists. Just as the Russian revolutionaries had to leave their ideals for a bit and get down to the problem of drains and sewers and transport, so in England, now that the fight has sharpened, our job is to get the miners fed. She saw the fascist crisis in similar terms. 
In addition to her political work in Britain and internationally, she led fundraising campaigns to aid German refugees and devoted considerable personal energy to finding homes for refugees in Britain. As with her fundraising for the miners' families, her charitable work involved more than a measure of criticism for those who had forced private intervention. In August 1936, she was involved in the formation of Spanish Medical Aid, which was arguably a political body thinly disguised as a humanitarian agency. The organization's official remit was to send a medical unit or units to relieve the suffering caused in Spain and to assist Spanish Democrats against Spanish aggression. The following April, she traveled to Spain with two pro-Republican MPs, the conservative Duchess of Athol. Oh, here she is in Spain. There she is with. The uh, Duchess of Athol is the, the sort of dour-looking Scottish woman, um, second from the right, and then Eleanor Rathbone, the independent liberal MP, um, who's on the far right. The women claimed that their mission was non-political and that they were interested in providing relief where most needed. However, they only visited Republican territory, and by focusing their public report on the plight of child refugees, the women highlighted what they termed the insurgents' disregard for innocent lives. They also produced a private report detailing objections to the scheme of frontiers observation, which had been put in place by the International Non-Intervention Committee, and circulated to potentially sympathetic MPs, including Winston Churchill, as part of their anti-fascist propaganda. So, in opposing the Spanish Civil War, the, um, Ellen had colleagues, um, not just in Britain, but internationally. The Indian National Congress, and in particular its young leader, Jawaharlal Nehru, took a similar stance on the Spanish War. Wilkinson and Nehru, who became increasingly close in the 1930s, campaigned together on behalf of the Spanish Republicans during his visit to Britain in 1936 and when he returned to the country in 1938. And this is um, Wilkinson on one of her trips to Spain with a group of Republican children. Um, and this is her speaking on a platform. She was often referred to as the pocket pastinaria um, because she was a, sort of a British and smaller um, you know, proxy for la pastinaria, the, um, the Spanish communist speaker. But she frequently campaigned um, with Nehru on um, pro-Republican platforms when he visited Spain. She also hosted a private reception for him to meet with politicians and journalists who were interested in Indian affairs and sympathetic to the Republican cause. And on February 3rd, she presided over a meeting at Caxton Hall in which Nehru spoke out against the imperialist behavior of the British government and its hypocrisy in condemning aerial bombardment of the Abyssinians by Italy while using similar tactics against Indians in the Northwest Frontier province. Ellen herself had repeatedly denounced the fascist practices of the British in the Northwest Frontier, drawing upon events she'd witnessed on her own travels to the region. When Nehru returned to Britain in June 1938, Ellen again acted as his host through the auspices of the India League. She organized a Congress at conference at the House of Commons in which he made clear his objections both to the program of federation laid down in the 1935 India Act and to the foreign policy of the British government. Here you can see um, some of the propaganda from that second trip, as well as the INC's work on behalf of the Republicans. After a trip to Spain accompanied by Krishna Menon and a visit to Czechoslovakia, which had recently been forced to concede the Sudetenland to Germany, Nehru returned to London and spoke on a series of platforms with Wilkinson, expressing his own conviction, shared by Ellen, that the cause of anti-colonialism should be understood as inherently in sympathy with anti-fascism. The two shared platforms at the Peace and Empire rally on the 15th and 16th of July, alongside Stafford Cripps, the African-American actor Paul Robeson, the liberal MP Wilfred Roberts, and others, a 17th July rally for Republican Spain in Trafalgar Square, as well as uh, various other events. And he also, as you can see, spoke at events where she wasn't present, as did his wife. The following week, they attended the World Conference for Action on the Bombardment of Open Towns together in Paris. The event was organized by the British liberal pacifist Lord Cecil under the auspices of the International Peace Campaign, and Nehru made clear his disdain for Cecil's imperialist assumptions. Nonetheless, both he and Wilkinson then rationalized that the severity of the European crisis merited cooperation with less progressive men and women, as long as they took a sim similar attitude towards fascism. Nehru returned to Britain again in the autumn of 38 and became increasingly vocal in his criticism of British foreign policy, with an analysis that again echoed Wilkinson's own. Writing in the Manchester Guardian on the eve of the music Munich crisis, he contended that the British government today pursues an even more intensely its policy of encouraging aggression and giving support to General Franco and the fascist and Nazi powers. No doubt they will carry on this way if they were allowed to, till it puts an end to itself as well as the British Empire, for overriding every other consideration are its own class sympathies and leanings towards fascism. 
I would be the last person to object to an ending of imperialism, but I'm deeply concerned with the prospect of world war, and it distresses me exceedingly to realize how British foreign policy is directly leading to war. Following Hitler's return from Munich, both Wilkinson and Nehru would together denounce the shame of England. Like Wilkinson, Nehru also recognized that charitable aid to the Spanish Republicans could serve both practical and propagandistic ends. Thus, after his visit to Spain with Menon and his daughter Indira, he launched a campaign to send the Indian Ambulance Unit to Spain, which you see behind you, as well as campaigning for Indians to send foodstuffs and medical aid to the continent. In a statement to the press, he made clear that his call for aid was not mere humanitarianism, saying, we seek this help in order to throw our weight, such as it is, on the right side in a vital conflict, which is a tremendous significance to us and to the world, and to dissociate ourselves publicly and through action from the policy of the British government. Wilkinson and Nehru had not initially been drawn together by their shared analysis of fascism and European politics. Rather, their similar approach to the, fa to the fascist threat strengthened a bond that had merged through Wilkinson's long involvement with the Congress movement. Um, while she would have claimed to have come by her convictions about Indian politics honestly, the roots which brought her into contact with colonial affairs were largely personal and contingent. As a young member of the Communist Party of Great Britain, she attended the Third Comintern Conference in Moscow in 1921 with, amongst others, the Indian exile M. N. Roy. And in March 1925, a year after she left the Communist Party, she nonetheless flew into Paris to speak at a rally against the deportation of Roy from France for his communist activities. In the following years, however, she became increasingly distanced from the Indian communist movement, where, whereas she became increasingly close to the pacifist movement and to the INC through her relationship with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. In addition to the Wolf, Wilkinson also became engaged with Indian politics through the left wing of the labor movement. She was a founding member of the Plebs League and a regular contributor to Plebs magazine. And in Parliament in the 1920s, she and many other Plebs Leaguers identified with a left wing ginger group, which was centered around um, the elder statesman of the Labor Party, George Lansbury. These dual networks of feminist, pacifist, and radical labor connections likely drew her to the League Against Imperialism, which held its first international meetings in Brussels in 1927. And, those, and she attended those meetings with Nehru, um, and both she and Nehru became involved with the League Against Imperialism, which was one of the many sort of front organizations funded by the communist impresario William Munzenberg, but which neither Wilkinson, George Lansbury, who was also involved, nor Nehru, initially perceived as a communist organization. Ultimately, however, both Lansbury and Wilkinson left the League Against Imperialism when the control of Moscow um, became more visible, and Nehru was expelled from, from the League Against Imperialism. Nonetheless, she maintained a close, <coughs> close relationship with Nehru after that point, and Ellen and Lansbury continued to work for Indian self-rule through an organization called the India League. Ellen traveled to, to India in 1932, um, through the auspices of the India League, and this is a photo from that three-month journey that she made, which was a fact-finding um, trip through, through India to see what um, British ordinance rule looked like on the ground. She traveled to India in part for personal reasons. Um, she just ended a long extramarital affair um, with a, a male um, MP who she was close to, and she said wanted to get out of the country. Yet her visit to the subcontinent had a longer impact of deepening her engagement with Indian affairs and pressing her to develop a more sophisticated analysis of colonialism. It's been suggested that she preferred Nehru to Gandhi because the younger man's politics fit more easily into a Western metropolitan socialist vision of modernity. Yet to reduce her analysis of the divisions between Gandhi and Nehru to unconscious cultural prejudices about modernity obscures key consistencies in her political analysis. She viewed socialism, feminism, anti-colonialism, and anti-fascism through the lens of the social advancement of the working class. During her time in India, she'd witnessed the marginalized circumstances of peasant families trapped in a cycle of indebtedness, and abhorred the financial system that concentrated the ownership of land in the hands of a small number of princes and zamindars, the same way she abhorred the concentration of industry in the hands of a few in Britain. She supported the nationalist campaign, but she did not believe that India's problems could be solved by independence alone. Ellen wrote a glowing review of Nehru's autobiography in Time and Tide and blurbed the book for the publishers, applauding Nehru as a champion of the masses, not merely a pure nationalist. At the end of the day, however, Nehru understood the problem of Indian nationalism to be inseparable from both the class struggle and the anti-fascist cause, whereas when push came to shove, Wilkinson did not. 
and it proved to be a crucial difference in their conception of social justice on a global scale. Wilkinson came under sustained criticism for the extent of her attention to international affairs, particularly when the situation in her own constituency of Jarrow was so dire. She had little sympathy for what she considered to be such a myopic view and made her contempt for her critics plain, saying, usual criticism, of course, from those queer folk who think that one can best serve the working class movement in this country by being completely ignorant of what happens outside of it. For Wilkinson, as for others of her generation and outlook, the ways in which she understood both domestic and international affairs were intimately interwoven. She brought her Marxist economic analysis to her understanding of both continental fascism and British imperialism, and in turn, her appreciation of Britain's role in international affairs affected her analysis of domestic politics. Her feminism was implicated by class analysis that affected the way that she perceived the status of women both at home and abroad. That said, Wilkinson's prejudices and limitations as a British national affected how she understood the world outside of her own borders. And hence, she ultimately, as a member of Churchill's wartime labor government, supports um, the British government's policy towards India during the Second World War and does not stand with Nehru and the INC in opposing um, the subcontinent's collaboration with Britain during the conflict because she perceives fascism to be a more salient and imminent threat than um, colonialism and ultimately can disentangle the two. Years later, she attempts to, to explain the ways in which one could balance an international and a national perspective. When as president of the founding conference of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, she would argue that we here could not be interested in international work if we were not firmly rooted in our national loyalties. You cannot build a bridge unless there's solid earth on each end of the bridge. And scholars have pointed to her words as evidence of the limits of cosmopolitan thinking amongst the generation that came through the Second World War. But arguably more significant is the sincere effort that Wilkinson and many others of her generation made to understand social justice on a truly transnational scale. As she went on to say to the end of that speech to her colleagues in 1945, international fellowship and national personality are not incompatible. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Thanks for this fascinating and really riveting um, talk. Um, um, let me perhaps start off by just asking you a little bit about uh, your sources. Mm -hmm. uh, did she leave behind a set of papers, or how did you piece the story together? Um, she did not, which was the one frustrating thing about her. I mean, I mentioned that she went to India partly because she had just ended this multi-year um, extramarital relationship with a fellow MP who was married. Um, she had another um, extramarital relationship with a high-profile member of her party, Herbert Morrison, who went on to be Home Secretary. Um, and while I don't think she had any personal shame about her, her own um, sexual relationship, her family was certainly concerned that it would impact how she was remembered. And after she passed away um, in 1947 from a drug overdose, which may or may not have been suicide, I think it, it was not. Um, her family had a huge bonfire and burned all of her personal papers. <laughs> so essentially, I had to chase her around Britain and on several continents. Um, I had a researcher who um, found me a few papers from India. I sort of followed her through France and Geneva and archives in the United States as well as archives around Britain, so chasing those who knew her, um, which made it perhaps a longer project than it otherwise would have been, but in some ways also pushed me to, to think about some of the connections beyond just her own kind of you know, organized narrative of her own life. Thank you. Yeah, it's, so we, uh, I want to open this up, but I actually, I have a question too before we do, but but the, the, the rules for this, uh, just to remind all of you, and many of you have been here before, but for those of you who haven't, uh, is is when you do ask a question, please wait for the microphone. There's a person, two people in the back who will be happy to give you a microphone and introduce yourself uh, before the question. But I want to uh, start off following uh, Christian's question with a, a question about biography. I mean, one of the things that, that uh, uh, academic historians are not trained to do is, is to write biographies. And it, and it does bring with it its own particular sorts of challenges. Now, sources obviously are one of those challenges that, that are, are distinctive, but I wonder if you could reflect a bit on, 
I, I can understand why you wrote this biography, because he's a fascinating person, but if you could reflect a bit uh, simply about the, the challenges of writing a biography. Well, I think one of the challenges of writing a biography, awkwardly, is, is just this sense that historians, that biography is somehow not real history, right? Um, and so, as someone who, um, who was starting this project as she was still going up for tenure, right? It was kind of a risk to write a biography as opposed to a sort of a, a more serious um, type of monograph. But I, um, but I also was someone who, you know, whose first book had you know, been bought by maybe a few people who share no DNA with me or are not librarians, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> was very well respected in the field, but was not um, you know, the kind of history that was reaching people outside of the academy. I mean, that's not entirely true because actually it was on the BBC and it had um, you know, within journalistic communities, a bit of reach, but it was, it was an academic book, and I thought biography would provide a vehicle to tell a story, but to tell it in a way that w could be read on two levels, right? And one of the sort of broader intervention in the historiography that I wanted to make was about how the early generation of kind of labor worthies, who are often presented as being kind of very exceptional and very British centric, that generation that formed Atlee's cabinet in 1945 um, when they were starting to become geriatric, right? <laughs> um, but were sort of exceptionally British focused. And many of them had this involvement both with continental socialism and many with early communist politics um, as well, and kind of continued engagement with with progressives, radicals, and socialist activists on the continent and in the United States. And so I wanted to tell that story of networks. And you could tell that either as kind of a, a network history or by following one individual's movement through those networks as a way to illuminate them. Um, and so this book, I hope, does that effectively and sort of shows both how Wilkinson moved through fas or internationalist and um, feminist and um, left-wing networks, but also how those networks link together um, in the 20s and 30s. But then it's also, you know, I mean, people will pick up a biography and read it in a way that they won't, you know, um, a historiographical intervention in networked history of the left in the early 20th century, right? And um, it has been gratifying to, to write something that is accessible to, um, to different audiences. And so it is something you're right, Dane, we're not trained to do, but it's something I'm glad I, I ventured into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're open for, yes. My name is John Martin, I'm a research fellow here and I was delighted to hear your presentation. This is a fascinating person I've never heard of. I have roots in England and I just had not any idea. Um, as, a, um, as a university student in the 50s, I met Clement Attlee who was visiting my university in California. And I wondered, was there any way in the book or, or in your, your search to calculate uh, her influence on him in any way? Um, in some ways, his, her influence on him can be shown by the fact that he included her as the only woman in his cabinet, despite the fact that she spent much of the 1930s and indeed the early 40s trying to undermine his career. <laughs> um, uh, she thought he was a terrible choice um, for a leader of the party when he was um, nominated to replace Lansbury in 35. She had, as I said, this intimate relationship with Herbert Morrison, who was kind of um, Atlee's nemesis within the higher ranks of the Labor Party and was constantly trying to unseat Atlee and become um, leader of the Labor Party himself. And she was, alongside Hugh Dalton, sort of intimately involved with those cabals to unseat Atlee. And despite the fact that he knew that, um, he nonetheless put her in the cabinet. And I think it was a respect for the kind of outsized role that she had um, you know, within the party at that point. And he was to agree, there's, when he puts together his cabinet, he has these categories in there. You can see his notes um, in his papers in the Bodleian. He sort of says the young person, woman, trade unionist, you know, and it's clearly, the, but she's, she's the one woman of the stature to be a cabinet minister, you know, of her generation in 1945. And he's willing to overlook the constant personal, you know, undermining. And I think by the time that she, um, she dies, she does, she has gained a respect for him that she did not have in 1935. Yes. Yep. <clears throat> I'm Kay Oshel, retired from the Department of Labor. I'm really um, a lay person in this field. I also was not familiar with her. Could you tell us a little about Wilkinson's early life and the circumstance of her birth and so on? Mm -hmm. So, 
I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that she comes from modest circumstances. Um, she's born in 1891 and um, in a kind of two up, two down, as they're referred to, sitting room, kitchen on the bottom, bedroom, um, two bedrooms, and then an outhouse in the back um, in working class Manchester. And she's a scholarship student. She's kind of of that generation. She has um, schooling stops for most people. At 12, she goes on and gets further scholarships and then ultimately gets a scholarship to the University of Manchester, which has started um, admitting women a generation before her. So she, um, she's a history major. <laughs> she goes on, at those days, basically, if you didn't get arrested in the year after you graduated from university, you were given an MA as well. But she would always put, <laughs> you know, and actually that's still the case at Oxford. Um, but she would always put, you know, MA after her name, MA. Um, she was proud of it. And um, she went on then, she, her first job was working for the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies um, as a suffrage activist and platform um, fundraiser. And then she moves into, during the First World War, working as a women's organizer for a trade union. And it's through her trade union then that she's sponsored to run as an MP. Essentially, um, I mean, this is a different world of cap campaign finance. And many of the early labor MPs come in through union money um, running their campaigns. And so essentially, she makes the move into parliament. In 1924, she's the only woman, um, only labor woman in parliament. and. Um, through, through this kind of backing of her trade union, which remains a base throughout her, through her career in politics. And then over the course of the 20s, she kind of establishes her name for herself, partly the way I discovered her, um, was when I was working on my first book, which was on the left in media policy, and whether a party that thought of itself as socialist and against the capitalist press as something dirty um, should use the so-called capitalist press to, to make its case to the nation. And she was always an advocate of using the popular press to sort of speak to the unconverted. And so that was kind of how I first encountered her, um, working on that project. And she does a lot of that in the 20s and kind of remains a journalist. When she dies, the Manchester Guardian says, you know, journalism has lost um, someone almost as much as politics with her death. Um, and, then, and then this kind of picks the story up in the 30s um, as she becomes you know, very active in anti-fascism. Thank you. No questions? Roger? <clears throat> uh, Roger Lewis, you mentioned uh, Herbert Morrison. Uh, could you tell us a little more about some of her other allies, friends, in the Labor Party, for example? What did she make of Stafford Cripps, for that, for that matter? Begum. <laughs> so she's... Um, as I mentioned, in her early, in the 1920s, she's part of George Lansbury's kind of ginger group. And she also, um, she sort of always sits with the radical Clydesiders. And could, could you explain that? Uh, what they are, yeah. So um, within the Labor Party, the Labor Party is a fairly broad church. Um, it still is. And so in some ways, its problems at the current moment are about the extent of the disagreement, um, even over such fundamental issues of leave and remain, right, within the Labor Party. Um, but. In the 1920s, the left of the party, there were kind of a group of MPs, many of them who were Scottish, um, often referred to as the Red Clydesiders. Um, and she, though she wasn't a Scottish MP, kind of identified with them and tended to sit and to vote with them. And she also was part of this, um, what British, in British politics we refer to as a ginger group, a kind of pressure group, around George Lansbury, who was also a very progressive and radical figure on the left of the labor movement. So she kind of was positioned on the left in the 20s. And the two people who um, Roger spoke about, Stafford Cripps and Nye Bevan, in the 1930s, kind of emerged as leaders of, of a left wing, again, um, very supportive of popular fronts, uh, against fascism, but also various other progressive policies. And Stafford Cripps is like, has a gazillion pounds, right? He's like one of these wealthy people who had their connections to the king, right? Um, and so, whereas Nye Bevan is a, is a minor who comes up and kind of, so they're in that sense kind of chalk and cheese, but they are very much politically aligned. And, um, and in 1936, with Cripps funding, Cripps and Bevan and Wilkinson um, and a couple others start this left wing political publication called Tribune, which is essentially a kind of equivalent of the nation, you know, small circulation but quite influential, and a left-wing um, publication. And as, so Wilkinson, along with Cripps and Bevan, is one of the initial editors of Tribune. And she is very much of that politics. Where she differs is, um, so Stafford Cripps is expelled from the party 
in the late 1930s in the Labor Party because he refuses to toe the line with the party's opposition to popular front politics. And um, she's the only person in the NEC, she's on the, the NEC is the National Executive Committee of the party, who votes against his expulsion. But she's unwilling to resign with him um, when he goes because she, from fairly early on, has a clear vision that if the labor, if if the working classes are going to come to power in a meaningful way, it's through the vehicle of the Labor Party. And one of the things that shows up more in the book than this talk is this reality that, well, she kind of transgresses boundaries and makes quips like, you know, if a labor official was encountered by someone who'd been beaten by fascist whips, would they really ask if he was a member of the second or third international, you know, I mean, and makes her politics clear. She stops at the point of doing anything they'll expel her for because the Labor Party for her is is the vehicle of the working class in politics, and she's not going to be on the outside. She wants to be, as they say in Hamilton, in the room where it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There was a question. Yep. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Natalie Hubertz. Well, was supposed to say anything else in the introduction? No, it's fine. No. <laughs> um, okay, um, my question is about, also kind of as a non-expert on um, this figure. Uh, I'm wondering, you mentioned she was very, very involved in kind of a far flung, if you look at it that way, a um, number of fields and both domestic and foreign. And so I'm just curious if you've got any sense, and you also mentioned, you know, from things like dictating in the bathtub, and you know, it just seems like she's, her energies are pretty spread out. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you got a sense, like through looking at her correspondence with different people, or the different sources that you mentioned looking at, you know, if that seem to do in any way, even if she wasn't aware of it, her, um, the impact that she was able to have, or if you think that actually contributed to it, having that really diverse um, set of focuses and, and, and backgrounds, because, yeah, I guess I wonder if, you know, that would kind of pull her in, in a lot of different directions. Um, so just even your opinion on, on that as you saw it. Thank you. And I think I mean, she certainly, she was never considered, though she was a prolific writer. Um, she, I mean, she wrote several books, a couple of novels as well, a lot of journalism. <laughs> but she was never considered an intellectual in the party. And I think that was because there was partly, partially a sense by some that there was an element of dilettantishness about doing so many different things at once. Right? Um, but she was also, and I think this speaks to some of the discussions that are being had now commemorating a centenary of women in politics. But I mean, while it remains the case today, particularly for a lot of these early female politicians, a lot of them felt that they had to make a choice between a political career and a family life, um, given the amount that they, of time and energy they needed to devote um, to, to politics to make that viable. And she was essentially someone who lived for politics. So partly the ability to do so much reflects the fact that she had no other life, right? I mean, the people she slept with were her work colleagues who were all married to someone else because she had never met anyone outside of work. Right? I mean, she dies of a drug overdose partly because she's a drug addict. I mean, she's asthmatic, but she's also a chain smoker. And so she just takes amphetamines, which are what they prescribed to treat asthma back then in sort of higher and higher doses. And then she takes sleeping pills to offset the amphetamines. and she ultimately dies of an overdose of sleeping pills. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, and so this is hence the debate about whether it's suicide or whether she's just someone who is a pill popper and kind of gets the doses wrong. But, um, but I think partly she's able to do so many different things because she's a workaholic, I mean, and without much else going on. And, but there, is, there isn't the sense, as there is with some politicians, that they're deeply and intellectually committed to one cause and are sort of great thinkers on those causes. She was a doer as opposed to a, a thinker. Thank you. Yep. Hi, I'm Rebecca Turkington. I'm the Assistant Director of the Women in Foreign Policy Program over at Council on Foreign Relations. Um, thanks so much. This was really fascinating. And I'm doing some work now on the origins of the global women's movement. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that. I'm particularly interested in how common her attitude towards anti-colonialism was um, within groups like Wolf for the International Congress of Women. Um, and more broadly, what were the tensions in those types of networks that included both people from colonized and colonial powers? Um, how did that play out, and is she the exception to the rule, or were there a lot of people in this sort of cosmopolitan um, world who did feel that collective identity trumped uh, the issue of colonialism? 
Well, thank you. That's a great question. And there's a lot of really good scholarship that's started to come out on international women's organizations and particularly this kind of East meets West and how those um, cultural encounters between European and Anglo or sort of um, North American women and um, women from what we would now more think of as the Global South were negotiated in the earlier period of the women's movements. Um, I think that the Women's International League amongst the various women's groups, and you mentioned um, the International Council of Women, which is a sort of older women's group that's a kind of very broad church umbrella organization. There's also another one called the International Alliance of Women, which is more explicitly con um, committed to um, a pro-suffrage politics and a women's rights agenda. But amongst those, the, which are the kind of big three of international women's organizations, the WILF was the most conscious about, um, about colonialism and also about the ways in which th the reality that their own organization was dominated by North Americans and Europeans gave them a certain kind of responsibility um, to think about, to you know, own their bias, I guess, um, on colonial issues. And so while was not true about all women's organizations. The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom was a very outspoken critic of um, British rule in India, in particular. Um, they were also they published a report, which you may know, called Occupation Haiti, um, about American intervention in Haiti, and had a branch um, in in Haiti. But then at the same time, people like Mary Church Terrell, um, who's an African American woman, who's um, you know, quite well known both in DC politics and education reform, but also uh, for her role in the NAACP. She was a member of the Women's International League, but she was also kind of a vocal critic to what she saw as some of their blind spots about their inability really to think themselves outside of the box of being kind of North American and Western dominated. Um, and I think you see that in Wilkinson's politics when ultimately she kind of abandons the Congress movement during the war and just, just you know, the priority is winning the war and she doesn't. Um, well, she remains sympathetic and speaks out, kind of, you know, says, once the war is over, we should just give um, the Indian self-rule. Sort of says they should wait it out, you know, I mean, priorities. Um, and so I think you see those, those different, you know, where you stand depends on where you sit coming through <laughs> in her politics there um, in the end. Thank you. Yes, I'm in the front. <clears throat> You mentioned a little bit about, sorry, uh, Bill Veal, I'm retired. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about her uh, late life uh, and the physical uh, problems she had. Did she mellow any in her views or <laughs> her actions? Or is that an inappropriate word here? <laughs> um, no, I mean, <laughs> the short answer to that. Mm. I mean, she sort of went out fighting. I mean, part of the reason I think that she was so overextended and exhausted at the time was that the um, by the time that the Labour Party comes to government with real a real working majority in 1945 under Clement Attlee, the party's been around for 45 years and has this kind of long list of things it wants to do in power without ever really having power. There were two very brief minority um, Labour governments in the 1920s. Well, one not quite, quite so brief, the other lasted only 10 months. Um, but they were kind of in government without being in power. And now they have this huge majority and they can do all this stuff and they're kind of old men in a hurry, or old men in one sort of oldish woman. Um, and, and she, um, as Minister of Education, basically is fighting to have her priorities make it to the front. And she dies um, literally less than a f two weeks after she finally gets through a commitment to put the money behind raising the school leaving age till 15. Because essentially, there's a recognition that in a kind of overstretched government, if the resources are put behind um, getting the number of schools built and teachers to man them to raise the school leaving age from 14 to 15 um, the next year, that other things, particularly housing, um, and after the Blitz, there's a real housing shortage, right, are going to have to take a back place at the queue. And she wins this fight with Nye Bevan, who we mentioned earlier, who is um, the minister in charge of housing at that point to have the school leaving age put through. Um, and it's this sort of, you know, big victory. And then she drops dead. Right? <laughs> but she sort of keeps fighting on it till the end in Captain. And there's some of, some of the great exchanges um, in the early years of the Atlee government are, are you know, fought over this issue of, of education and what is owed to, to the next generation. Thank you. Any other questions? 
<laughs> I do. Um, one of the things I found really intriguing about, uh, about the book, uh, you, you mentioned that you, you, you were really interested in thinking about these networks, right? And really cosmopolitan networks. And you talk about the extraordinary travels that she engages in. She's all over the place, right? Um, and she meets all of these astonishing people, uh, Lenin, Trotsky, uh, Gandhi, Nehru, <laughs> Einstein. I mean, you can do down, down this list. And, and I'm just wondering, I mean, is, is this interwar period a kind of unique moment, do you think, for this kind of cosmopolitan networking? Or, or, is, it, or is it just seen that way because we know all these people now as, as famous people? I'm just. And I do think that transportation, in, you know, advances in transportation help. I mean, but it's only, you know, she's taking, she's actually sort of hopping across the channel fairly regularly on planes um, by the 1930s. She, she flies, she's one of the few women delegates to the um, San Francisco UN um, conference in 1945, and she flies to San Francisco, right? I mean, that's a, it refuels about five times across <laughs> Canada, but, um, and I, so I think that there's a way in which, um, Flight, but also motor cars. I mean, the number of uh, most of her travel in and out of Spain is um, by car through the Pyrenees. After she gets, she flies to Paris and then um, drives. And then just the fact that you can, if the weather works with you, right, cross the Atlantic in four days. Um, so I think that the the world is, in some senses, kind of as a practical matter, shrinking by the early 20th century um, in ways that make that kind of globe trotting as possible. And obviously, there are people who, just with sort of longer journey times, are, are real cosmopolitans before that. But I think that there's, there's something about the kind of the shrinking, also the media world, right? I mean, once we live in a world of kind of radio and you know, then just the, the speed with which information is moving is changing. Um, and that enables a certain kind of cosmopolitanism, I think, or at least enables it on a larger scale with less effort than <laughs> perhaps was the case in the 18th or 19th centuries. Mm. Um. Great. Any other questions? I've, I've got uh, one or two more. <laughs> um, if there's time, do we have time? Yes. Um, two more questions. One is um, built sort of on, on Dane's questions about her international networks, and I, I love your your story about um, her networks. She spent considerable time clearly in India. I mean, traveling for three months in India. That's you know, three months in India traveling. That's, <laughs> wow. Um, uh, clearly, she's you know she, you mentioned she she was in Spain several times during the civil war. Um, could you talk a little bit more about um, her networks in Moscow? You mentioned she was there in in August '36, just bef before the um, short trial started. Um, somebody who's working on a biography of somebody who grows up in 1930s Moscow. I'm sort of particularly interested in um, in in these networks, um, but also her her view of you know Stalinist um, the Stalinist dictatorship as it um, as it moves on you, you mentioned this but I would love to to hear a little bit more about this and then second perhaps final question uh, since we're here at the Wilson Center um, uh, to to ask about the larger relevance of of her life of her biography uh, why should you know why why should anyone be interested in her life, other than sort of a covert way to look at, you know, uh, um, into <coughs> uh, um, 20th century British, uh, early British history. Uh, what's what's sort of a larger meaning for for us today? Well, to take the um, the first question first. <laughs> um, uh, she, so she first visits um, she first visit, visits Russia in 1921, um, when she attends the Third Comintern Congress and also the prof and turn meetings. And it's also then they have a women's congress in 21 for the first time. So she's kind of there as a delegate to all three of those. And then she stays afterwards and she tours around Russia on one of these kind of you know tours that are obviously led by, you know, um, <laughs> as they were, by political officials. And in some ways, I mean, she just, she writes a lot about that time and she's sort of fascinated. I mean, she's not unaware of the extent of the real poverty and, um, 
in Russia. She becomes ill and she says she thinks she might have gotten you know, the, the last of some drug that was available in the city because she was a, you know, a, a valued foreigner. Um, but she does, she swallows basically hook, line, and sinker what the government has to say about the famine. Right? Um, and she comes back and she's a real apologist about the famine in the 21. Um, and she does, she remains throughout the 1920s someone who, who is not unaware of the problems of the Soviet Union, but remains convinced of the potential of the experiment. And in that case, she's not alone, right, amongst not just many on the British left, but many on the, the international left. Um, and her views start to change after Trotsky's expelled. As Dane said, she, um, she meets both Lenin and Trotsky, but she stays in touch with Trotsky. Um, and I mean, she sends, she, she sends Trotsky copies of Hansard or the parliamentary record in Buyukaida. Um, you know, I mean, she's like posting them to him right, um, just so that he could follow events in the British parliament. Um, and so her concern about the way, and she attempts unsuccessfully to get the British government to give him asylum. Um, so there's a kind of increased wariness about Stalin that starts early on, but it isn't until 36 that you hear her speaking publicly negatively against the Soviet Union. It's only with the show trials. And as I said, she then also is not one of those people. She's no George Orwell, right? She's not denouncing what the Soviets are up to in, in Spain, because for her, the fact that the Soviets are in Spain is the crucial point. Um, but by the war, by the outbreak of the war, um, she, while she is supportive of the Soviet Union when Britain and the Soviet Union are alliance, um, has no truck for the communist press in Britain and any kind of attempts to, um, to play down the British at the expense of the Soviets and basically says, you know, British communists are people who acted as dupes for Moscow throughout the 1930s, who attempted to undermine the Labour Party, who attempted to undermine democracy in Britain. Now they've done this about face because of the fact that the Soviet Union was invaded and obviously we're now allied with the Soviet Union, but these people are not to be trusted. I mean, she becomes very, towards the end of her life, very anti-communist. Um, and that is a real shift. And it's a shift, I think, partly to do with Trotsky, partly to do with the show trials, and also partly to do with the way in which, um, when she left the Communist Party in 1924, certain members of the CP turn on her very virulently because she was perceived as a traitor and really held her up as kind of all that was wrong and hypocritical, and I think there was a lot of personal animosity that did feed into that. Um, on the bigger question of why we should be interested, I mean, I think, um, I do think the question about how the international left operated in the early 20th century is an important question, and I think the book is illuminating on that. But I think also, I began by saying that we're kind of entering a centenary of women's enfranchisement and of women's entry into parliamentary politics in Britain. And there have been a lot of statistics that have come out about the ways in which women, female politicians, have and have not been commemorated within British society. Um, we've just had on Parliament Square a few months ago the unveiling of a statue of Millicent Garrett Fawcett, who is the leader of the National Women Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. And there'll be a statue um, of <coughs> Emmeline Pankhurst, who was the leader of the militant suffragettes, the um, sort of window-breaking arsonist, you know, um, um, hunger-striking suffragettes, the are ones that Americans are, you know, know much more about than the constitutional activist um, in Manchester next year. But there is comparatively very little recognition of how women in British politics, other than Margaret Thatcher, have shaped the development of the nation in the modern period. And I think that Wilkinson is one of the the largest you know, women figures in politics in Britain in the last century. And in some ways, an understanding of her life kind of reframes an understanding of what women were doing and were capable of, not just in a kind of women's sphere, but she's obviously not operating predominantly in a women's sphere, right? She's just someone traveling around with, you know, leaders of the international communist movement working in you know you know in the trenches in spain you know smuggling refugees out of the Tsar after the plebiscite i mean she's very much a an operative in a male dominated world and so i think it's kind of illuminating about what women what really was woman's sphere in the early 20th century okay. thank you uh, final final question then okay <laughs> briefly <laughs> Uh, what was her view of the United States and particularly uh, social justice in America? <clears throat> well, she goes over to the U.S. Um, in after the Depression, and she has these, I mean, in some ways writes these quite funny articles about how, you know, walking around the streets of Manhattan 
everyone is selling apples in the autumn you know, as, as a way to kind of, you know, a form of charity. And do you feel that you can't buy enough apples and you know what to do with them and you buy them and give them on to other people if you have money in your pockets? But, um, but she has a more serious critique about how in a pre-Roosevelt Depression era America, the lack of anything even you know, approaching, I mean, she has a lot of criticism of the dole for unemployment assistance in the UK as being inadequate, as essentially leading to child malnourishment, as being punitive and insufficient, but she says at least it's there. And when you look at the United States, you see a world that really is about survival of the fittest and the lack of any social net, safety net at all. Um, and I think for her, traveling in America, which she does a lot throughout the 20s and 30s, she sort of, there are a lot of British politicians, Churchill including, um, who make their money off of sh speaking tours in America <laughs> in the summers. They go when Parliament goes into research, recess and they um, you know, have paid gigs around the United States and Wilkinson is one of them um, who, who does this quite frequently. Um, but she's, she does spend a lot of time consequently in America and I think she does see America as a kind of cautionary tale of what um, capitalism unfettered can do to people in times of adversity. Um, but she also sees America as this place of kind of great potential, and she has a lot of colleagues. She's particularly, um, you know, within the AFL-CIO um, and, the, and the women's movement. Um, but it's, it is a place where the excesses of capitalism are for her in, in high relief. Um. Thank you. I think um, we'll, we'll leave it on, on that note. Um, Thank you, Laura, for this Very terrific uh, uh, talk, a learned and enjoyable discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Let me remind all of you that uh, next week we'll have Emily Dufton with us on grassroots, the rise and fall and rise of Mar Mariana in America. Um, with that, let's give a round of applause and invite you to the conversation over in the reception room. <laughs>